Well, Lindsay Tanner, welcome. Could I start by looking at what is perhaps the most substantive point in the book? You argue that there's been a demise in the Labor Party as a party of ideas generation. Now, when did this happen in your view? And perhaps more importantly, why do you think this has happened? I think it's something that's happened over about the past 15 years or so, David. Obviously, you don't flick a switch from being ideas generating to not. So I think it's been a gradual erosion, perhaps since the late 90s. I think partly it was a backlash to the era of the late 80s and early 90s when Labor was a big generator of ideas and the trade union movement was a big generator of ideas and reform agendas. And I think there was a lot of reform fatigue around in the community and indeed in the Labor Party in the late 90s and around the turn of the century. And that has bred some unfortunate habits. And so now we no longer seem to have the equivalents of Medicare, Occupational Super, the Accord, the Republic, big reform agendas being incubated within Labor. There are still big things happening, but they tend to be things that have been generated outside Labor that Labor responds to. But of course, your, uh, uh, well, your former colleagues still there would argue that things like the NBN, uh, the carbon tax, the National Disability Insurance Scheme, whether you like the ideas or not, they are Labor ideas and they are big ideas. Oh, I agree with that, but you need to look at the genesis of these things. The National Broadband Network was a response to a particular set of circumstances. It wasn't something that was developed over a number of years in consultation with other parts of the Labor movement. It didn't happen from within. It was just a serendipitous response to an unusual set of circumstances where you had the fibre to the node proposal that we got the election with effectively fall over for a range of reasons and so we had to make some sudden choices about where to go. Yes, it's a worthwhile Labor thing, but my point is that it doesn't reflect a great deal of from within effort mm. and ideas generation and campaigning and incubation of big reform agendas from within the wider labour movement. The National Disability Insurance Scheme, exactly the same. That was something that has been worked on and developed and pursued from outside the labour world, essentially. And when it hit centre stage and we were under quite a lot of political pressure at places like community cabinets, we outsourced the process to the Productivity Commission. So I think they're well, pretty on, Bill, good Bill examples. Bill Shorten would argue that, uh, that he and Jenny Macklin and others came up with this idea, wouldn't they? Oh, no, I don't think they would because, in fact, it's something that had been campaigned for by various organisations, particularly people like Bruce Bonahady, mm. for quite some time. They, as ministers, or Minister and Parliamentary Secretary, obviously had a key role, but in a sense they were doing their job. So the Labor movement more widely can't claim any great credit for that. Mm -hmm. There are no uh, areas where you can say that this is something that's been incubated over a number of years from within the Labor family and that you then had leading Labor politicians with ministerial responsibilities taking it forward. Is That's part of what this problem Is part of this problem to do with the people? Uh, is it the pre-selection process, how people are pre-selected, the sort of people that are ending up in Parliament for Labor? That is part of the problem. I'm worried about the rise of the professional political class. I'm worried about the ever-mounting dominance of the mechanics of politics, the clever spin doctors, the clever manipulators, the short-term win-the-day operators who have little interest in how the broader world functions. Now, that's not everybody. People are obviously complex amalgams of different characteristics. It's just that those sorts of skills and approaches, which do have a role, have, in my view, become too dominant. And one of the key reasons is that more and more you end up with people in parliamentary roles who've essentially non done not much else in their adult lives but politics. So I, I think there is a problem there. It's not an easy problem to solve, though. In general terms, how important is leadership in, uh, in the culture of the party uh, and this problem that you talk about? Look, actually not that important. It's not irrelevant. But I don't blame Julia Gillard, Kevin Rudd, Kim Beasley, Simon Crean, uh, Mark Latham, any of the leaders over that period of time because it's been a, a gradual evolutionary process. Each of them their own, in their own way can claim credit for having pursued particular agendas and so forth. So this is a problem that is much wider than leaders. It's also a problem that you can see in equivalent parties in many other parts of the world. And you can also see the same parties, 
Social Democratic parties mostly that, like Labor, have been used to getting 40% plus of the primary vote, now getting in the mid-20s. So there is a wider global trend happening here. And even though it can be painful, even though home truths are difficult, we need this trend to be confronted to, for people to rethink the approach of the party. Well, now, your, uh, your former colleagues have been pretty quick to dismiss your analysis. Uh, I'm not sure if any of them have actually read your book. In fact, I'm pretty sure most of them haven't yet. <laughs> but Simon Crean said uh, it was inappropriate, unhelpful and wrong. Bob Carr said it's just another book rubbishing the Labor Party. Did any of this reaction surprise you? Oh, it doesn't surprise me. And I've seen this over 40 years or so, David, that you get these very serious debates about the future of the Labor Party surfacing from time to time, and that's always the reaction. It's never the right time. There's always today's battle to be fought. They're always worried that you might give Tony Abbott a one-liner that might be useful for about two hours and then everybody moves on. Well, who cares? It has zero impact on anything, that sort of thing. But it, it does the give Tony Abbott the ability to, to, to say that one of Labor's uh, most senior former ministers says they're not a party of ideas. And to which my response is, well, so what? Uh, who cares what he says? That'll have no impact on anything, on anything. What really matters is the future, future generations of potential and actual Labor supporters, people who will contribute huge amounts of energy and effort for a cause. And if Labor is not a cause, if Labor is not a calling, but it is just little more than a cynical shell that is there to sustain power structures that serve the interests of some people. If that's what we end up, I'm not saying we're there, but if that's where we end up being, then you won't have those people and you won't have a long-term future. So Labor as a cause, as a self-sustaining political force, has deteriorated very substantially over the last 10 or 15 years, and similar things have happened in social democratic parties around the world. It needs to be reinvigorated. There are complex explanations why those things have happened. The emergence of globalisation, the imperatives of environmental sustainability have changed the political landscape in ways that have been very difficult for Labor. So there are all kinds of reasons that are not anybody's fault why this is happening. But to simply dismiss it and pretend it's not true, I think, flies in the face of reality and abdicates responsibility for the long-term future of the party. Let's turn to the dumping of uh, Kevin Rudd. Uh, you say in the book that it was the wrong decision uh, and, the, and the claims that the Rudd government was a dysfunctional shambles were a gross over-exaggeration. But you do paint a picture in the book of, of an increasingly uh, troubled administration. You, you say, and I quote, by the beginning of 2010, the Gang of Four process was deteriorating, meetings were called, rescheduled and cancelled with great regularity so that I lost the ability to schedule diary appointments any more than two or three days in advance. How bad had the decision-making process become? Well, I can't comment on it now, of course, because I haven't been part of it for two years, but there was a period over a couple of months early in 2010 where things got fairly messy, where the net effect of just having too many balls in the air, largely a product of trying to implement election commitments and then having a huge additional workload from the global financial crisis imposed upon us, that impact started to take its toll. Mm. But one of the things that hasn't been written is that in the probably four to six weeks prior to Kevin Rudd's removal, the level of activity from that so-called Gang of Four had dropped away quite substantially. So although I can't say this for certain because I never talked to him about it, I kind of got the impression that the foot was being taken off the accelerator on that Gang of Four front because Kevin was responding to a growing sense of unease around the place. Particularly in the early part of the year, it was pretty full on mm. and I think we suffered from just having too many things but on the other hand it did enable us to give really substantial strong and protracted examination of very complex issues that just would have been physically impossible in a wider cabinet context. But it, it, wasn't just this, it wasn't just this complaint about the concentration of power in the Gang of Four. There, there were concerns that uh, Kevin Rudd was um, treating backbenchers and senior public servants with contempt. Uh, do you concede that there, there were managerial problems from the leader at the time? Oh, I concede that there were managerial problems. What I dispute is just how significant they were. Mm. The, the nature of the business of running a government, particularly a government that's been under huge pressure as a result of the global financial crisis, particularly a government that is still relatively inexperienced, is going to produce some robust exchanges, is going to produce people under intense pressure, is going to produce those kind of problems. The real issue is, are you adult enough just to live with that? 
do your best to constructively improve things or are you going to spit the dummy about it? And the truth is, of course, David, that these things have been there for quite a while. Kevin Rudd's style didn't change over that time as far as I could see it. There's only one thing that changed and that's opinion polls. Nobody pursued these issues when he was riding high in the polls. Nobody pursued these issues when it looked like Labor would win an election in a canter. What happened was all driven, in my view, even though there are extraneous issues floating around, it was all ultimately driven by panic at a sequence of ordinary opinion polls. And all of this stuff is essentially retrospective justification for the unjustifiable. What about his decision to shelve the, uh, the carbon pollution reduction scheme and then the dithering over the mining tax? How significant were those factors? Look, one of the things that's, of course, difficult to assess is the, the complexities of some of those issues, particularly the mining tax, where there are all kinds of negotiations going on late in the, in the day that I wasn't directly involved in. So it is hard for me to have a clear picture of where things had got to on that front. You were the finance you minister. Seen... You, you weren't involved in that? Uh, well, keep in mind that these are tax issues. Tax issues are the mm. province of the treasurer. So had there been... Had, had things got to a point where we were about to resolve a proposition, yes, I would have been in, uh, in that discussion. But obviously, as, as had been the case previously, these are things that are ultimately in the carriage of the Treasurer. So some of those discussions that occurred right at the end before Kevin Rudd was removed were not discussions that I was part of. I was getting, uh, along with others, some report back of roughly what was occurring, but not in, in huge detail. So it is difficult for me to give any kind of comprehensive view of that. Wayne, Wayne I can, Swan, however, of course. Sorry. I can, however, give a pretty comprehensive view of what happened with the carbon pollution mm. reduction scheme. Kevin had, on the one hand, a couple of people saying, hold the line, and on the other hand, a couple of people, and again, I don't want to talk individuals or their roles, but it, or several people actually saying, no, Tony Abbott's great big new tax campaign is going to damage us, possibly terminally, you've got to cut this loose, you've got to get rid of this. And one and of those was Julia Gillard? Yes, and he ultimately came up with a proposition that I think in his mind was a sensible middle ground path through these two very difficult possibilities. And in other circumstances that may have worked, but mm. as it turned out, that didn't work. And he in particular, and the government, lost a lot of credibility as a result of that change, just, exacerbated, just... By the exacerbated by the fact that the decision was leaked and so mm -hmm. the government lost control of the announcement of that decision. But just to be clear, what you've said there, Julia Gillard was one of those well, arguing to it's a matter of, the it's a matter of public. It's a matter of public record. That's right. been widely reported and, and not uh, contradicted by Julia. All right, now, Wayne Swan, of course, is one of those sitting uh, around that Gang of Four table. He was Kevin Rudd's treasurer during that February leadership contest earlier this year, which you've said a lot of over-exaggerated things uh, were, uh, were said, which have damaged Labor's brand for a long time to come. Wayne Swan argued that Kevin Rudd had no Labor values. What did you make of that? Look, I don't know, to be honest, David, and I think it's, it's a very difficult thing for any of us to be talking about what's deep inside anyone else. It's, it's, it's a very hard thing to make any kind of accusation of that nature. So it's not an observation that I'd make, but I don't want to get into commentary about uh, specific things that Wayne may have said or not said. Uh, I don't know the context and I'm very keen to avoid making any kind of comment about the individuals concerned in all of this. Uh, that's, that's ultimately for people to form their own views about. But can I ask you just finally then, can Labor recover from what was a very damaging leadership split uh, and remains damaging to the party, as you argue? Can it recover from all of that while the key protagonists are still in the parliament? Uh, yes, it can. There's, there's no particular reason why these sorts of things can't be overcome. They have been overcome in the past. Uh, obviously, when you have these dramatic events that really fire people up and entrench long-standing uh, angst, I suppose, uh, it, it is going to be difficult. But politics is a very practical game and people are always ultimately on about winning in some form or other. So the broader dynamics mean that, yes, those things can be overcome, whether they already have or whether they will be in the future is going to be a matter of debate whether uh, people will see these things differently. But I, I believe Labor can win the coming election 
Uh, I, I don't say it's guaranteed by any means, and it's obviously up against it, but it's been up against it before. John Howard was up against it from time to time, and he managed to, to win. So uh, you never write off an incumbent government, no matter what the circumstances, no matter what speculation there is about who may or may not be the leader, you never write off an incumbent government in an election contest. As for the longer term future, that's really where the challenge lies. That's really what my concern is about, is that it's all very well to focus on the day-to-day -day contest, the who's going to win the day and what Tony Abbott said on the TV tonight, all those kinds of things. That's unavoidable. The trouble is that people lose sight of the bigger picture. The bigger picture here is that the Labor Party has slowly been atrophying as a political force in this country, as are equivalent parties around the world. Part of its base has been eaten up by the Greens and although they'll go up and down, they potentially might eat up more of that base. It has some significant medium to longer term problems and it needs to think very carefully about what it is on about in the medium to longer term in order to be a viable, dominant political force well into Australia's future. Lindsay Tanner, thank you for joining us. Thanks very much, David.